Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, thanks, first of all, to Gresham College uh, for inviting me to speak to you today, and also, of course, to Museum London, who are our hosts. Um, well, in a, in a fairly short period of time, I'm hoping to talk about quite a lot of stuff. Um, and stuff is really the focus of my lecture, things. Um, I mean, sometimes we, we worry a bit about things, that we're too obsessed with them, we're too interested in them, that we put things ahead of people, um, which is probably true um, on occasion. Um, but really, I would argue that things aren't something that we set aside from people. As an archaeologist, when I'm looking at material culture, I'm looking at the treasured possessions of people, I'm looking at bits of their homes, uh, their clothes, uh, the, the money that allowed them to purchase the food that they ate, to buy a present for their friends. Um, so from my perspective, things and artefacts made by people are really fragments of people's lives. And really part of what we try and do as archaeologists is piece these back together in a way that's going to tell us about how people were living in the past. Um, in London, we have some really amazing opportunities to do that. Despite the fact that Roman London isn't really with us today, I mean, it pops up here or there across the city, you can, uh, you can go and visit little bits of it, uh, there's been enormous amounts of excavation um, in the city, particularly within the last few decades, as a result of developer-funded work. So we go in and excavate sites um, around the time that a new building is being put up. And this really gives us an opportunity to get, to get to grips with some of this stuff. And in fact, if you go upstairs and look in the Museum of London galleries, or if you visit the Archaeological Archive, um, you'll find that we found lots and lots and lots of things. Um, so yes, stuff, things, objects, is what I'm interested in. Um, of course, the problem is that having found these things, we have to try and find a way to, to make sense of them. Uh, memorably, archaeology has been described as some kind of hellish jigsaw in which we only have a few of the pieces. We don't know how many are missing. Um, we don't really know how they go together. Um, we probably will never have all the pieces. We'll never finish it. And someone's made off with the front of the box, so we don't know what it's meant to look like. Um, but hopefully, um, uh, there are ways that we can kind of move on a little bit. And um, I'm really going to be trying to just talk about that today. I'm not going to be trying to present a history of Roman London. We don't have time for that. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about the way that we approach things and how stories can arise from them and how kind of a narrative of change can, uh, in the Roman period can arise from them. So here's roughly what I'm going to try and do over the next, um, next little while. Is First, I'm going to look in detail about a number of individual objects. Uh, these are mostly quite nice things um, because you know, everyone likes to see a nice picture. Um, but they're also objects that speak very vividly about people's lives. They've got stories to tell us. And I'll try to put them in a bit of context and try and tease some information out of them. I'll then go on in a bit more detail to try and explore object types. So to look at how, when you start grabbing all these individual objects and putting them together, um, the kind of, kind of broader narratives about how they were used and who was using them um, can arise from those. Then I'm going to look at the idea of context, which is very important to us as archaeologists, especially um, archaeologists who are working on excavations, because a big part of an object's story is where it came from, and I hope I'll be demonstrating that quite clearly. And then finally, I'm going to kind of zoom out as far as I possibly can and talk about um, Londinium, that is uh, Roman London, on, on quite a wide scale, um, and talk about how these quite small finds can uh, really contribute to our understanding of what a big city was like. So, uh, to begin with, this is a rather wonderful little object. Uh, the photo is very large, um, the object's very small. It's about 25 millimeters high. Uh, it was made out of amber, spotted by a very sharp-eyed archaeologist uh, digging through mud on the banks of the River Walbrook um, a few years ago now. Um, it's made out of amber, um, uh, which, of course, is a kind of fossilized uh, resin. Now, that's interesting to us for a number of reasons. We don't find things made out of amber uh, very often, uh, so there's a certain kind of rarity to it. Um, and we actually know from reading uh, Roman sources, people like Pliny and Artemidorus, that amber had a particular significance to the Romans. We know that it was a very valuable material. Uh, mostly in the Roman world, it's coming from uh, the Baltic Sea area, although there are other sources as well. And there were big uh, set concentrations of workshops in the north of Italy around uh, Aquileia. 
Um, and it is quite possible that that's the journey that our object will have made. Uh, uh, but as well as being valuable, in fact, so valuable that it was remarked by ancient uh, writers that a statue of a man carved from amber, as in a small figurine, was worth more than man himself. Um, as well as being valuable, it was also thought to have magical properties, uh, perhaps related to the fact the way it captures light, perhaps because it's valuable and exotic, um, perhaps also because if you rub amber, it takes an electrostatic charge, which is an interesting scientific phenomenon, but which must have seemed quite interesting to the Romans. Um, and they write a little about what this kind of magical significance was, particularly the fact that uh, it was meant to have kind of positive effects. So to dream of uh, amber rings was meant to be a good omen for women, um, and in particular, the idea that uh, amber objects were amulets. They would give you good luck, they would protect you, and particularly would protect small children who are ill. Um, now, interestingly, this particular amulet has been carved in the shape of a gladiator's helmet. Now, this is a, an altogether different side of uh, life in Roman London. Um, it's been used um, because there's a little bit of wear around the perforation. Um, so we know this is a personal possession that somebody had for some time. So why is it being carved in the shape of a, of a gladiator's helmet? Well, we can put that idea into a little bit more context. It is not rare at all for us to find things that look like, um, have some kind of association with the arena. In fact, if you go upstairs at the moment, there's a lovely little temporary exhibition in the foyer on precisely that topic. Um, but we really do find a lot of this kind of material culture with images of gladiators. Uh, in London itself, from around 70 AD, there was an amphitheatre which was big enough to seat thousands. And remember that Roman London is not an enormous town at this sort of period of time. So we can imagine at least half the town's population could fit into it at a time. So people were gathering together to see these events, to see gladiatorial combat, to see other uh, spectacles. Um, but we also find lots of these sorts of things. Uh, here's a ceramic oil lamp with a picture of a gladiator on nice piece of uh, red Samian tableware with two gladiators facing off. Um, and here's a rather nice glass cup. Well, the interesting things about all three of these objects, of course, is they're all made in moulds. They're mass-produced, uh, mass um, and which really speaks um, of, the, of, of the popularity of this sort of stuff. Um, interestingly, though, even though they are mass-produced, uh, uh, we do have the occasional oddity this is a nice uh, cup found quite recently at Old Jewry in the city of London. And as you can see, this is probably a piece of sporting memorabilia. You actually see the names of the individual gladiators above their heads. Uh, this one, just so anyone can read fully, um, his name was Birdo. And he's just lost, basically. He's dropped his shield. Um, he's raising his hand in supplication, while the other guy is still very much holding his sword and shield. Things might not go well for him. Um, and interestingly, this is the only example of this particular design that has ever been found. Now, some of the gladi named gladiators appear on lots of these things. So whether this is because Birdo's career ended quite quickly and quite bloodily, <laughs> we don't know. Um, but it is a reminder of the fact that, um, although you know, this, these are things to do with sport and what we're very much considered sport in the Roman world, it is, you know, it's, it's a serious matter. It's a big difference between the Roman world and ours is that people did die doing these things. Um, it, it, the gladiatorial combat is a bloody affair. So, so is it, what about our amulet then? Um, or our, our, our piece of amber? Is it just a really posh example of this, of sporting memorabilia? Or, in fact, is it... Um, an amulet? Is it something that was thought to have and meant to have magical um, properties? Well, I think it is. Um, uh, the latter. Um, I think chances are that what we're looking at um, is a very, very fancy thing, probably bought by um, wealthy parents for their child, partially perhaps because the child was a big fan of the games, but also perhaps because they were sick um, or sickly um, or just because the parents wanted to uh, take good care of them. And there's reasons uh, to believe that gladiators and gladiators' um, symbolism would kind of make sense within that kind of context. On a very basic level, it's a helmet. A helmet is a protective thing. On the other level, oh, gladiatorial combat is all about striving and it's all about life and death. Uh, in fact, we find very similar uh, gladiator helmet amulets on the continent on, in one or two graves uh, associated with exactly these sorts of contexts. Um, with young children. Um, and there's a nice example from Roman London itself of gladiator symbolism appearing in a funerary context. Here, a fallen gladiator appears next to 
the Egyptian uh, god Anubis, who is a guardian of the dead, in a cremation burial from Southwark. And this suggests to me very much that this idea of gladiators is intimately uh, involved with this idea of life and death, and that um, that particular small example probably was for you know, a sport-mad child whose parents indulged him, but also who cared a great deal for him, or indeed her, and wanted to look out for them. So this is an altogether different um, type of object from the city. This is a rather wonderful discovery, some years old now, um, a Roman writing tablet made out of wood. It would have had wax um, filling the central recess, and into there was into the wax would have been incised the writing. Here's the original. Here's a, a kind of a mocked-up version with the uh, the inscription made a little bit clearer. Because when we, uh, even though the wax itself very rarely survives, when we get lucky, a kind of you know ham-fisted scribe has uh, pressed down hard enough that they've left the traces of their writing beneath. It's kind of like that whole thing in movies with a telephone pad where you can work out who, who wrote on it, what on it last. And this is a very, very interesting text. The uh, work on it, of course, done by uh, Roger Tomlin, who's a, a great Roman epigraphist. And uh, it's, it's this incredibly important document um, describing the, slave, the sale of a slave girl named Fortunata. And this immediately provides us with information about Roman London that we just didn't have before. Here's a transcription, and here's his translation. I'm not going to read it all out in detail. I'm just going to focus in on certain key features. First of all, it's written in a quite a strict format. Um, it's very much written, couched in uh, legal language. Uh, there is discussion of liability. There is discussion of the amount of money um, required. Um, it's very much a sign that writing was being used in London right from the start within this kind of context of legal arrangements, of business. The same things that the City of London, of course, is quite famous for today. Um, we can tell a little bit, bit about where Fortunata, this slave girl, came from. Uh, she's from Gaul, so just across the channel. Um, so we get an impression of where slaves are coming to London from. We know how much money was spent on her. 600 denarii, the, the silver coins. And that, to put that in a bit of context, is about two years' wages for a Roman soldier at the time. So that's quite a lot of money. Um, this is kind of interesting formulation. The girl in question is transferred in good health, and she's not warranted to be able to wander or run away. Um, which is interesting, because whilst Fortunata seemingly could be trusted to kind of stay put, uh, the archaeological finds from Rome and London tell an altogether darker story about slavery in the city, and the fact that this institution really played a really big part in London's history from the very beginning. And this is a find uh, from the 19th century, but there are quite a few examples of these from the city. In fact, we found another within the last couple of weeks. Um, these people could not be trusted not to run away and probably lived under quite appalling conditions, uh, being uh, with very, very little opportunity um, to advance themselves. Uh, but interestingly, there's also a suggestion here that that wasn't the case for, for all people, because if you notice who's buying... Fortunata. Fortunata is being bought by a slave. In fact, she's being bought, and she's being bought rather, by the slave of a slave. It's a really, really complicated situation um, in terms of your legal status in Roman London. Some slaves did very well for themselves. These are imperial slaves, direct slaves of the emperor. They were probably quite high-ranking officials who came to the city. Fortunata, um, who's been you know, purchased for quite a lot of cash, is working for them. You know, she, she's pro she probably working under circumstances where they don't fear her running away. Um, other people, really altogether different. The other thing that this tablet tells us a little about, about as I've mentioned, is the fact that writing is hugely important in Roman London, and it's something which really marks it out uh, within the context of Roman Britain. Uh, here we we have um, in excess of 500 examples of wooden writing tablets surviving, many, many other inscriptions. An awful lot of them are to do with this whole kind of idea of commerce, of business transactions. Um, an awful lot of it, the written texts are to do with the Roman army. 
And that's precisely because writing in a society that where literacy rates would have been significantly lower than they were today uh, was really a tool of power. And things like these fa rather fancy metal ink wells, um, which have been found in a number of sites in London, I think really reflect that. And they're, in fact, they're, within Britain, they're quite heavily concentrated here. So here's, here's a, a third object which can tell us some interesting stories. Uh, this is a little flask made out of copper alloy, made in fact out of a leaded bronze, as we've had it analysed. Uh, it was absolutely beautiful, um, much corroded now, but beautiful remains of polychrome enamel decoration up the side. These kind of swirling trumpet scroll motifs in blue and in white. And there's traces of enamel missing from the top. It's a really, really interesting object. Stylistically, we can date it probably to the second century AD, perhaps a little earlier. Um, it was found in a significantly later context of the fourth century AD, um, perhaps because it's been redeposited, but perhaps because it was a nice thing, you know, a Roman antique that was kept for centuries. Um, complete examples, or near complete examples, um, one of which is known from a Roman cremation burial at Corbridge in the north of England, have a short neck, which project from here, and a kind of wide base. And these, a hole there, along with this hole here, allowed a little carrying handle to be attached. Now, we don't know exactly what the contents, is are, the contents are, and so we can only guess. But I think a very sensible guess um, is that we're looking at flask for something like perfume or oil for bathing. And this is because similar drop handles appear on uh, bath flasks, which people used to take um, to use in Mediterranean-style rituals of bathing. Um, and also the fact that the, the volume is not large, so we're talking about some kind of precious liquid. Um, stylistically, we can say that this object has also travelled to come to London. Uh, it was m most probably made in northern England, where at sites like Castleford, there are moulds for making similar enamelled vessels, or there is a little tradition of similar enamelled vessels with forts from the western end of Hadrian's Wall, uh, which suggests that they were probably made in that area. So there seems to be a number of workshops producing these sorts of things. But the really interesting thing for me is the fact that we have this object probably used uh, for a very Roman, a very Mediterranean, a very continental um, form of bathing tradition, but that it has this, this decoration whose roots is very much in the local British Iron Age. So what we're seeing here really is a very kind of Romano-British uh, cultural object. Um, and this is an idea that we can explore a little bit further if we turn to some of the other objects decorated uh, in an Iron Age style from the city. We find things like these little harness fittings, um, things like this uh, fitting from the scabbard of a late Iron Age um, sword, or indeed uh, this uh, handle from a tankard. This is, would have been from a very, very large vessel. There's a nice example up in the, the galleries here from uh, Kew. Um, which could have held about four pints. This is for quaffing significant amounts of beer, probably. It's interesting that these objects, uh, with their focus on kind of martial activities, uh, horses, weapons, drinking, um, have been found within the area of the first century Roman fort here. Now, whether that's because the Roman soldiers are uh, stealing them off the, the locals, or whether, in fact, uh, as w uh, we suspect, some of the locals are getting in with the Roman soldiers, seeing that a uh, the Roman army is doing very well, and I'd rather be on their side than, uh, than ours, uh, uh, isn't entirely clear. But this is a, a wider phenomenon in Britain, where these kind of Iron Age uh, types of objects, uh, which are really associated with certain types of uh, elite male display, are kind of absorbed into the Roman army and then kind of military culture. So these, these are kind of, you know, taken on... Uh, you know, in, in their original form. But interestingly, there's a suggestion that other bits of Iron Age culture weren't suitable um, for, for really this new Roman city. And the way that they came into this city was being changed. So you see this Iron Age coin with a hole perforated in it. That is really not a common phenomenon amongst the many, many thousands of Iron Age coins known from Britain. And it's here in Roman London that we find it. Now, that might be because it's uh, a symbol of an Iron Age tribal identity, a local person who keeps on wearing it long after 
that it stops being legal tender, as it were, uh, in order to try and hold on to something of the past. It, because it's made up of silver and it's quite valuable, it could be a little trophy from a Roman soldier again who's, who's had it off someone local. Um, in fact, this is, interestingly, this is a, an East Anglian style of silver coin, uh, and it's found in a context dating to just after the Boudican Revolt, where an East Anglian queen and her tribe uh, burnt London to the ground and then were in return brutally, brutally suppressed. So do we have a little moment of history here? Do we have a Roman soldier um, who has uh, picked up some silver in the aftermath of the Boudican Revolt? Um, but clearly, there's something a little bit more complicated going on. This is uh, a really wonderful object, uh, a neck ring, which is very much a British Iron Age uh, style of uh, dress accessory. Uh, it's, 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 you wouldn't find a, a, a well-to-do woman in Roman Italy wearing kind of big, heavy things like this around her neck. But the motifs and the style are very much continental. So if you like, this is the, the flip side of the flask we just saw, where people are mixing together these different visual languages to try and present um, themselves in a way that, that really kind of ticks all the boxes. You see somebody who wants to wear this symbol of uh, authority that people locally from uh, Britain will recognise, but is also quite keen on the materials and quite keen on the visual language that people who come from elsewhere will understand as well. So those are some really nice individual objects. I want to talk now about what we can do when we move on beyond that and start to think about objects as groups. So here's our group of objects. Um, these are Roman brooches. Um, they're very nice, I think. Um, uh, one of the great things about brooches, though, is that they can be dated quite precisely because we find huge numbers of them. Uh, they can also uh, be provenanced fairly accurately uh, so that across the empire, people were not wearing the same style of brooches. There were workshops in different parts of Germany, parts of Italy, parts of Britain that were producing quite different sorts of products, which makes them really, really useful and interesting objects for us for, staring, uh, uh, for studying connections between places. So I can divide these ones quite nicely into types that are made in Britain and some types that were made uh, on the continent, this one probably from Central Europe, Germany, Switzerland, somewhere like there. Um, this one, for example, probably from Gaul. And what this gives us an opportunity to do is, again, to get the sense of how objects flowed into Roman London. But one of the many interesting things about brooches is that they aren't, um, they aren't, despite the fact they're quite beautiful things, they aren't high-status jewellery. Every, almost everyone would have worn one. They're more like clothes fasteners. They're also something that perhaps people wouldn't have thought about that much um, a lot of the time. But obviously, there are some very decorative ones. And our impression is that the vast majority of these things didn't travel as big consignments. There wasn't a boat full of Central European types of brooches that turned up in Roman London. More likely, um, a lot of these things travelled with people, the people who were wearing them. So I wouldn't go as far as to say that every single Gaulish brooch was worn by a Gaul. Um, if we get a lot of Gaulish brooches, chances are there's a lot of people coming over from Gaul. Um, and one of the really nice things that we can do um, is try and get a, a greater sense of how we can put this connectedness into perspective. So here is the results from a recent um, bit of work that I've been doing on our excavations at Bloomberg London. It's looking at about 170 Roman brooches from the site. We can compare these to other samples from Roman Britain as a whole, and indeed earlier samples from London. And these are all different types of brooches, basically. Um, as I hope you can see, there are some great similarities between these different uh, graphs. Um, but the real key, key thing that I want to focus in on here is, well, the lack of late, later brooch types is interesting, but mostly through the chronology of our site. But even amongst these early types, the relative proportion of these two columns here is much, much higher um, when you compare them to other contemporary types. And these are precisely the continental brooch types. And this is a reflection of the fact that Roman London in particular um, is very, very, very closely associated uh, with what's going on over the channel. In fact, Roman London as a foundation uh, is probably uh, an entirely 
uh, immigrant foundation. There was no great big city uh, in London before the Romans came. There were people living here, but mostly in small scattered uh, farmsteads. It was really a large movement of people that established this city. And the, the, the high percentage of continental brooch styles is really a reflection of that. Um, here, interestingly, is what happens to those styles over the course of the first century. So this is a period of only about 40 or 50 years, and this is from the same site. Uh, in each successive chronological layer from the site, the blue brooches, which are the continental types, become less important. And that's probably partially because it's easier to buy a brooch from a, uh, somebody with a workshop down the road uh, than it is to import one over back from where you come from. But it also probably reflects, like our nice pieces of Celtic art in Roman Britain, that there's a much greater uh, degree of cultural mixing going on, that this new city is uh, attracting and absorbing people from the surrounding countryside, drawing them into this urban centre. Um, and interestingly, by the end of the first century AD, if you can imagine your, your boatloads of continental immigrants who would have worn very much the same style of brooches as anyone back home, there, um, by the end of the first century AD, that's not the case at all. Completely different uh, makeup uh, in terms of what people are wearing, in terms of dress accessories. So London, despite the fact it's a kind of a new plant in southeast England, very quickly diverges from the continental mainstream, um, which, is, which is interesting. So here's another class of dress accessory. And this, is, um, uh, this image is uh, a beautiful one provided by the Museum of London. Uh, there's been a great big project that went on recently, which is um, really uh, scanned and described and put the, all the evidence for Roman hairpins up available on the Museum of London's website. It's a fantastic resource. You should check it out. Um, but these are, these are really interesting objects. They're intimately involved with the really quite fancy hairdos of, um, of Roman ladies. Um, they were used to both arrange the hair and to fix the hair in place. You can see um, they've got some quite or ornate headgear on these kind of self-referential um, hairpins here. And so we, as a class of object, they're really useful um, for studying uh, Roman women and how their fashions change through time. Now, it's um, by, by really pulling a lot of this evidence together, we can say um, quite, quite interesting things. So here is chronological evidence for two classes um, of hairpin. Basically, uh, long um, ones that taper on their lengths, and then ones with kind of knob heads and swelling shafts. It's, uh, they're, you know, they're similar sorts of things, but it's, I hope you'll agree with me, it's quite an interesting morphological change. And if you look at how their chronologies relate to each other, you see that at the, this type here dives just as the other type uh, increases in popularity. And what I think we have here is evidence that one type was supplanting another um, as hairstyles changed through the Roman period. And this has been looked at in more detail by other people um, who have shown also that the lengths of Roman hairpins change over time, uh, with shorter pins becoming more popular in the late period um, as kind of closer set, perhaps slightly less fa fancy hairstyles become the norm. So that's all very well, but... Um, if this is just reflecting the changes in hairstyles that we can already see, perhaps, on changing courtwing portraits and, courtwing and sculpture, it's not really telling us anything terribly new. But what I'm really interested in is this. Because if Roman London is the foundation of the city is about here, around 50 AD, it is about 50 years later that you first see uh, a great jump in the popularity of these pins. Um, which is interesting, if these are our kind of index of Roman female hairstyles, why don't we have them in the first 50 years of this supposedly very Roman city? Well, there are a few different ways we could interpret this. We could say there aren't very many women in early Roman London. Doesn't seem hugely likely to me. Um, there are, is, in fact, some demographic um, kind of skewedness in the cemetery, suggesting that perhaps early Roman London had a, quite a male population, but it's, you know, it's not 100% at all. Um, so if there are women here, um, are they just not wearing the kind of fancy hairstyles that required these things? 
that seems more reasonable. Um, or perhaps they're doing their hair in a different way. It's been argued recently that um, there was an, another way of doing up your hair in the Roman period, which is essentially by stitching the hair together. And in fact, uh, perhaps um, in a lot of our readings of classical texts, we've been uh, mixing up uh, pins and needles, both of which can be referred to by the Latin word acus. So perhaps this is a period where most hairstyles are uh, stitched, and then we have a sudden shoot in the second century um, of... Uh, styles that require pins. Well, that's possible. Um, but when you add the evidence for metal hairpins, uh, you get a slightly different um, picture. And we can see that hairpins were popular, or were present, rather, uh, in the first century AD. Uh, but there were these altogether rarer uh, metal hairpins. I wonder um, if what we're looking at here is a situation in which, in early Roman London, it was people who could afford these sorts of things, who could also afford the time and the effort required to get your hair put up like that, which isn't quick. Um, <laughs> you can watch wonderful reconstructions on YouTube of people getting their hair done. Um, it, it takes um, you know, a long time, and if you've got places to be, or you don't have a slave to do it for you, it's, you know, it's a great investment. So suddenly we have this picture where perhaps we have this whole language of hair where some people, you know, have these kind of shiny hairpins and these big elaborate do's, and other people just don't because they can't afford it or because perhaps they're local women who aren't really that interested in continental fashions. Um, interestingly, I'd really love to know what happens at the beginning of the second century to suddenly make um, this huge boost in bone hairpins. This is a much, much cheaper material. And do we see, an in and they're much more common bone hairpins, are we seeing a point at which suddenly these elaborate hairstyles kind of explode and uh, are absorbed into the populace much more widely? Interesting ideas, hopefully. <laughs> I find them interesting. <laughs> um, here, just a, a, a final example of, of this idea of looking at whole assemblages. Uh, this is, again, a little bit of work that I've been doing recently, uh, looking at bracelets. Now, in the, the literature, if, if you're a, a Roman find specialist or, or just interested in archaeology generally, you'll almost always find Roman bracelets referred to as uh, female dress accessories. Uh, there's good reasons for this. Um, we find burials of women with lots of bracelets, especially from the late Roman period. So we know that women did wear bracelets. Um, the problem is we tend to just kind of take that interpretation and dump it onto other material that isn't found um, in burials sometimes. And um, this sample of, of bracelets that I've been recording recently uh, struck me from the beginning as quite odd. There are a few types which we don't really get in the late um, uh, Roman cemeteries, these wonderful kind of polychrome uh, twisted cables made out of iron, brass, and bronze strands, very colorful things. Um, things like these broad strip bracelets, which you don't get in the, these, in the later Roman period. But, you know, is that just a fashion change? It's a chronological tr uh, trend. We're not wearing the same clothes today as we would have been in the 1960s, either, even never mind 200 years ago. Well, yes. Um, but equally, there's another big difference, and that is the size of these bracelets. So here are some examples from the Eastern Cemetery of Roman London. And uh, along the, the bottom of the graph is basically just different sizes of internal diameters. And like most uh, cemetery assemblages, there is a little peak here, around 40 or 45 millimeters, which are children's bracelets. And you can see that they were found with adolescent skeletons. Uh, and then you tend to get a second peak here, which are associated mostly um, with female adult burials, occasionally one or two males or possible males. It's not always easy to sex. Um, archaeological skeletons. I hope you can see that my middle Albra example looks very different. Uh, we've got this gap where the big um, adult female peak ought to be, and instead we've got these huge things, mostly made out of black stone, like shale or jet. Um, so what does this mean? Why should we even care? <laughs> very big um, bracelets. Well, I think what we have evidence for here is people wearing these objects in a different way, um, and perhaps different people wearing these objects. Um, in fact, if you look, go 
running around looking through the literature for Rome and Britain, looking for other really big bracelets, <laughs> which I've spent quite some time doing, it's really interesting that some of the other sites that produce them are military sites, um, particularly sites in Rome and Scotland that have recently been looked at by Fraser Hunter, um, and sites like the Fortress of Caerleon in Wales, again, have lots and lots of these big, big stone armlets. So is, so is that what they are, essentially? Are we looking at something perhaps that's worn on the upper arm um, instead of um, around the wrist? Um, are we perhaps looking at something that's worn by men in the early Roman period as opposed to uh, by women? Um, I think that's probably the case. And a, a, an interesting feature, again, in terms of this whole issue of uh, cultural transmission and the development of new identities, again, is the fact that that way of wearing stone bracelets is also very popular in the British Iron Age. Again, the plot thickens a little bit in terms of who these Roman soldiers who, who've come over here to conquer local natives are. Well, they, a lot of them are probably from uh, kind of the Celtic Northwest provinces or, or, or the German ones. Uh, but they're obviously finding quite a lot here in local culture that they like. Um, or, as I said before, perhaps there are a lot of people um, who are quite a bit more local, siding in with these guys. Interestingly, um, uh, and uh, a nice kind of side look at this, it's the fact that this type of bracelet here, which is also found on, a, on the, these sites, is a type that has recently very convincingly been argued by Nina Crummy, who's a small finds um, expert, uh, to be our mille, uh, which are military battle honours awarded to Roman soldiers. Uh, now, this is really something kind of interesting because before we started looking at these sites, I would have said that uh, in Roman London, it's women who are wearing bracelets. And suddenly we have a situation where actually in, in early Roman London, it's probably men who are wearing bracelets, probably, possibly quite a few of them, um, <laughs> some up on their upper arm, perhaps some smaller ones on their wrist, um, or those, those could quite possibly be those of children. Um, and that rather than dressing um, like people who, who lived just a short way across the, the channel, they're dressing like people who lived here um, beforehand. So, I mean, hopefully, uh, we can kind of agree that, that, that these sorts of patterns are interesting, and they give us a clearer picture of what life was like in the past, what people looked like, um, what people were doing, how people related to each other. Um, so I'm going to move on to my next section now, which is really to talk about the idea of archaeological contexts. So this is individual um, excavated assemblages of material, um, individual buildings, structures, rubbish pits. Context can mean a lot of different things on different scales. Uh, but how this idea of context can bring objects together in ways that can help us interpret them in interesting ways. Uh, this is one of my favourite examples from Roman London. This is a building that burnt down on Gresham Street, not so far from here. Um, you see this nice burnt partition. There's this lovely, uh, albeit much damaged by later activity, mosaic floor, which is probably a reception room, very, very fancy thing. Um, but then just in this corner here, through the wall, there's this magnificent little assemblage of Roman pottery. And really this idea of context and objects in context um, helps us because we can think, well, why are there an awful lot of flagons in a line um, in a burnt area? Well, our interpretation of this is that this is a shelf that, um, in a storeroom that is burnt uh, down in the fire and the contents have collapsed onto the ground. So suddenly, by putting objects into context, we can help, they can help us to interpret buildings. So we've got a storeroom or possibly the corner of a kitchen. Sadly, we don't have all the rest of it. It's out, outside of the trench through the wall from a reception room. <laughs> Um, and really, you can do that on the room-by-room room level, but you can also do it on a kind of broader property-by-property by property level. You can look at the, the contents of individual rubbish pits. You can look at the material which occasionally gets left uh, in situ uh, on floors and within rooms. And we can really get a sense of some of the differences between people who are living in Roman London. The fact that we had everything really here from very modest homes... Uh, to really very fancy ones. And these photos are of some of the reconstructions of those homes that you can see upstairs in the Museum of London Galleries. But in fact, context can give us some perhaps even more precise little snapshots. 
So we've noticed real recently that we get a lot of this form of pot down wells. They're about this big. Sorry, there isn't a scale on that photograph. <laughs> about maybe 40 centimetres high. Um, so why are we finding complete pots down wells? Well, they're not rubbish in the sense that, you know, they're not broken, they haven't been thrown away. Um, archaeologists really like explaining uh, odd things as ritual. Do we have um, uh, the votive deposition of these pots into wells? Wells are interesting places um, because it's very important to get clean water, so they're also places that kind of go down into the earth, perhaps towards the underworld. Are, are we seeing a focus of ritual activity? Well, possibly. Um, or possibly that this type of pot is really, really useful for carrying water. Um, perhaps we have you know, pots that are useful for storing and carrying water around the place. And if you drop it down a well, the water's going to kind of cushion the fall and you're not going to want to climb back down there to retrieve it. So again, context is giving us these interesting ways to approach how objects function. It's kind of a two-way um, thing. Of course, if it is a water jar, it might be a very appropriate thing to use as a votive deposit in a well. So um, it's, it's a murky situation, and archaeology can't always give us hard and fast answers. But here is um, another idea, and this is, again, a phenomenon that we encounter in Rome and London quite a lot, the idea of the foundation deposit. These, this material culture deliberately placed in relationship to a building. In this case, buried under the floor, a little beaker with a lid on top of it, which is kind of broken, unfortunately, now, and a brooch inside. Um, and the conventional interpretation of these is that they are exactly that. They are votive offerings um, to local spirits or gods to ensure good fortune um, for the building and for its inhabitants. And that's, that's great, and it's, it's a really interesting recurrent pattern that I think we, we can kind of get behind, we can believe in. But actually, we can move even further than that. We can find um, some really very specific patterns that perhaps we can interpret in, in a more precise way. This is a, a, a little pot found within the makeup of a wall of a first century Roman building, which had this really interesting group of objects inside it, part of another amber amulet, um, a burnt fruit, perhaps burnt as a gift to the gods, a number of deliberately broken objects, an iron key with the end broken off, and a military style buckle. Um, now, I like to, to, uh, to kind of in. To, uh, think about these things with a little bit of drama. I like to think, well, what actual actions do these reflect? So, you know, they've burnt the, uh, the fruit, they've snapped the, um, the objects, um, perhaps they've rolled the dice into the jar, they placed the iron key in last, which I would argue is a deliberate way of sealing um, the deposit in place, locking it into the building. Um, but, uh, so we can kind of get some sense of perhaps what some of the symbolic um, framework around all of this might have been. But interestingly, dice have now turned up in three separate um, deposits in uh, Roman London, quite often in association with something which might give us a hint of the profession of the people involved. So here we have an uncut gemstone, and another one was associated with a little lead alloy model of a cleaver. So do we have some... See, are we getting a sense of some very specific... Um, Roman beliefs associated with when you set up a new business. Perhaps you're rolling your dice to, uh, as a symbol of good fortune because it's a gamble, it's a new thing you're doing. You're including something which is likely to help you get that good fortune, like your little amber amulet. Um, but you're also um, te basically telling the local spirits exactly what it is you're trying to do here um, so that they know what kind of good fortune to give to you. Uh, we've got we've a few different examples of these now. There's more, some more details in the transcript of this lecture. Finally, in the last few minutes, I'd like to talk about what we can do when we really kind of zoom out to a city-wide scale, move beyond these individual um, contexts, and try and think about how does Rome in London function. Now, we, when we're talking about that, we tend to talk about things like this, big public buildings. We tend to talk about things like the fort, we tend to talk about things like the amphitheater, which you can go and visit at Guildhall Yard, at the uh, art gallery there, the forum, which is a great marketplace in the centre of town. And that's all good. Um, those are all very important things for understanding how the city works. But, but we can actually place objects into that context. So the work that we do at MOLA and other uh, archaeologists working in London uh, is really 
very much based upon this idea of, of linking everything together, building up a picture. Uh, so we've got an enormous database with records of all the finds we found and where they've been found from across London. And I'm just really going to take a couple of examples and try and explore and see what was going on in these different parts of the city. So we, we already said that you know, there are different big public buildings, there are some differences in the street plan, perhaps, there's this kind of orthogonal kind of arrangement here to what's happening on the opposite side of the Warbrook Valley, where it's all a bit more higgledy-piggledy. Um, and it's been argued by some people on the basis of this evidence um, that what we have are parts of town which are functionally different or perhaps even have different communities living there. Um, uh, th there are hints of that. For example, these um, circular buildings, these Iron Age-style roundhouses, which are north of the Thames are only found to the west of the Walbrook. So again, is this this idea of London absorbing in the local population? Well, um, looking at different classes of material culture that come from these sites that can be associated with these buildings, we can explore these ideas in a bit more detail. So here's some nice example of Roman pottery from Rome, London. Hopefully you can see that there are an awful lot of different types. Uh, and here are some imported amphorae, which are transport vessels that they brought things like wine, olives, um, fish sauce in from the continent, and some nice shiny red Samian tableware. Now, if we get all this evidence from all these different sites, we can start looking at who liked or who chose or who could afford certain types of pottery more than others. And there are some really interesting um, patterns. So I've color-coded these sites. So basically, the, all that you really need to know is that the red ones are from the east of the city, the purple ones are from around the valley in the middle, and the blue ones are from the west. As you can see, there are some quite clear patterns in terms of where the different colours appear. So people in the east have pottery assemblages with lots of amphora, which, as I've just said, reflects imported commodities. That's partially probably because the forum's there, um, and that's where a lot of this amphora would have been traded. So we're getting an impression of what the forum's doing, um, but perhaps also because they're more interested in these commodities than people living to the west of the Warbrook. Um, uh, people in the purple area... Um, and indeed, to, to some degree, people in the red area have this kind of quite uh, broad-speaking interest in a really quite elaborate range of, um, of pottery vessels. Um, and really, the defining feature of the purple assemblages, and uh, if you ignore amphora, then the red uh, assemblages plot here as well, uh, is that they have this kind of very wide range um, of things, with, particularly... Um, with emphasis on uh, the elaborate tablewares that were used in the Roman world. Uh, things like lots and lots of different plates, storing lots of different foods. This is all part of quite sophisticated, elaborate customs of eating. Uh, in contrast, the blue sites are kind of dragged down towards this corner here. Um, and this is really dominated by cooking wares and um, by jars. And this is very much, again, food that, and uh, approaches to cooking that would be in an Iron Age tradition. Now, these are just pots. They're just things. But when you start to think that, that these people don't have plates or they don't really have many plates, are they all eating out of communal um, vessels? That's quite different to the idea of a table with lots and lots of little kind of finger dishes with finger food that you can eat out of. And these patterns um, are there for us to find and explore further. Um, I won't dwell too long on this, but here's us back to brooches again. And this is a very similar sort of statistical analysis. And hopefully what you can see is that these blue brooches, which are all types that are made in Britain, cluster together, so they're found, frequently found together. And they are found particularly west of Walbrook, that's our area with the jar-dominated assemblages and with the roundhouses, and in Southwark. In contrast to these red types, which are found mostly in the middle Walbrook area, and east of Warbrook. Again, these are the areas with the larger amount of imported pottery. So these are complementary patterns, suggesting that people who lived in different parts of the city actually lived really quite different lives. Um, they had different tastes, perhaps different access to uh, different materials because of economic reasons. Um, I won't spend much time on this because I'm beginning to run low on time. Uh, but we can perhaps even develop these ideas further by looking at uh, particular 
objects and their distribution when they might have very specific meanings, such as uh, these elaborate belt sets, which are um, uh, essentially uh, uniforms for high-ranking officials and military um, people, which are in London are only found north of the Thames, not in Southwark. Um, and crossbow brooches, which are kind of a complementary style of brooch, which was worn up on the shoulder by the, of the same people. That relationship can be seen in graves and also on mosaics and other sorts of things, which again are found up here, not down here. So do, we have basically a situation where in the late Roman period, there aren't an awful lot of um, important people living down in Southwark compared to up in uh, Roman London. <laughs> It's a controversial idea. <laughs> um, it's probably oversimplistic, but we can explore these issues. Um, co uh, conversely, what they do seem to be doing a lot of in, Roman, in the late Roman period is metalworking. Uh, and there's an interesting shift, again, by comparing the distributions of objects from the early Roman period, where crucibles are quite widely distributed over the city, to the late Roman period, where they're really concentrated in Southwark. So this is a small type of object, but by looking at it on a grand citywide scale, perhaps this is telling us something about how this industry of metalworking is organized. You can do that incredib in incredible detail, um, as my colleagues uh, John Shepard and Angela Wardle did. And you can look at things like glass working waste, his moils from the end of blowing irons. If you look at it in, with great chronological resolution, you can actually practically see the glass workers move from site to site. So the earliest um, glass working sites are here in the centre of town. Then you, they get kind of shunted over to the edges of town. Uh, and you, there's this progressive uh, movement uh, through time as the, the industry seems to be being pushed out to the edges of town. Now, there's all sorts of ways you can interpret this. Is this gentrification in central Roman London? Um, is this glass workers wanting to be on the edge of town because their industry is a bit smelly and uh, they don't want to be too near houses um, or fire risk, or is it because they want access to raw materials um, to that coming in from the edge of town. But you know, hopefully you can see that there is an incredible potential to take artifacts and to build up quite sophisticated models of how things are happening, what things are happening in the city. Here are just a, a final example. I'm beginning to run slightly over. Um, this is the uh, distribution of Roman horseshoes. Now, you might think that trying to plot the distribution of things that move around um, attached to horses is a terrible idea, <laughs> and it probably is. Um, but hopefully you'll also agree with me that there is a big concentration of them up here at the top. In fact, over the half of the horseshoes from Roman London have been found in that part of town. Um, so what does that tell us? Well, these are temporary slip-on horseshoes, so does it mean that we're used for metalled roads and things like that? So does it mean that horses aren't really coming into town there? It's only when they go out of the town, uh, sorry, that it's only when horses go out of town and go on the roads that they're putting these things on. Do you not have, you know, an awful lot in the way of horse traffic in the centre of town? Um, is it because horses are coming in from outdoors? We're getting a big stabling area here and the people and goods are continuing into town while as the, the horses aren't. Perhaps there are you know, congestion zones in the centre of Rome and London. You're not allowed to bring your cart through here. It's an interesting idea. Anyway, there's lots and lots of uh, patterns that we could look at. Um, uh, I would say that we're reaching a really interesting point in the study of Rome and London where we've amassed huge amounts of data, uh, a lot of which is complementary, and we really need to stick it all together. Hopefully I've kind of made you think that there is, there is worth in studying the artifacts from the city. Um, and, uh, and really, that's, that's kind of the next, next step of trying to tie it all up. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, thank you very much to Gresham College um, for inviting me here and to all these people. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed.